I'd like to call to order it seems like this November 3rd, 2021 meeting of the Clearwater Downtown Development Board. I'd like to welcome you all and ask you all to silence your cell phones, cease personal conversations or private conversations. Uh, members, when you're addressing uh, the other members, please lean forward so the microphone can pick up your comments and speak clearly. And we'll begin by introducing our members and ex officio members, beginning on my left with Ray. Ray Casano. Shahab Amrani. Enan Kinsel, Paris Morphopoulos. Festus Bobeni. Mark Bunker. Thank you. Oh, it so. works. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to item. Yes. I, I, I do want to let you know that um, Caitlin Jamo called me and she has an emergency that she wants here tonight with one of her pets. She is okay. But. Okay, good. <coughs> okay, we'll uh, proceed to item 2.1. And... Uh, we're looking at the uh, minutes of the September 8th, 2021 meeting. Yes. Are there any, is there any request for corrections? All right, is there a motion to adopt the minutes of the September 8th meeting? I move to adopt the minutes of the September 8th meeting. Okay, move, moved by Festus, seconded by Ray. Is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay. Now we're looking for uh, any uh, request for corrections of the September 15th, 2021 meeting. There being none, uh, we'll look for a motion to adopt the minutes of the September 15th meeting. Anyone? I move to adopt the September 20th, 21st meeting. December, September 15th, 20th. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Very good. So, motion by... Shahab, seconded by Festus. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. It is unanimous. Okay, now uh, we're, the next item is citizens to be heard regarding items not on the agenda. The, uh, <coughs> these comments are limited to matters relevant to the DDB district. Comments on items that are actually on the agenda will be held until the agenda item is called. You must uh, clearly identify yourself for the record, and there's a time limit of three minutes. Yes, Good sir. evening. My name is Patrick Raftery. I'm a 42-year resident of the city of Clearwater, and I reside in the countryside area. My question is in regards to the last meeting I attended, which I believe was the 15th of September. The chairman distributed questions for the DCMA regarding the current funding request for $82,000. I am very interested in the success of downtown development. I thought those questions were quite appropriate. My question is, have those questions been answered, either in discussion or for public record, to be viewed, or are they still open? And if they are open, has there any timeline been established for these questions to be responded to? I have not received a response to this date. I was expecting uh, a presentation today, but I found out a few minutes ago that it's been uh, he was unable to attend, and we're expecting a response at the next meeting with a briefing on it. Okay. I also thought at that same meeting, I believe there was the, part of the approval was for the marketing director to be hired, and they were hired, and I thought some of these answers might very well come from that person's responsibility, which was entirely appropriate, that they made that funding at that time. So I would therefore assume that at the next meeting, perhaps that presentation will be made. Is that correct? Yes, we're, we're counting on it happening. It's Very good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your interest. Okay, now we'll go on to item 4.1. And uh, Anne, would you take care of this item? August 2021 <coughs> financial statement for five. Good evening, Anne Lopez, CRA Program Specialist. Um, before you have your... August 2021 financial statement for filing. In August, there were $12,272 spent. Uh, those expenditures are outlined in your agenda. And your ending balance for the month of August was $425,889. Any questions? Are there any questions? Okay, are there any citizen comments on this matter? Okay, I'm looking for a motion to adopt the August 2021 financial statement for filing. I move to adopt the August 2021 financial statement for filing. 
August financial statement for filing. Very good. Do we have a second? Shahab? Okay, so Keenan, motion. Shahab, second. Any discussion on this? I guess not, Anne. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay, and now we're going to go to the, uh, oh, you're going to stay up for the next one. Too. <laughs> okay, the September 21, 2021 financial statement. And is there a presentation or anything you want to tell us about it? Yeah, same thing. Um, this one is a little bit different. Um, again, Ann Lopez, CRA Program Specialist. This is your September uh, statement for filing. There were $34,262.29 that were spent during the month. Your ending balance was $391,627.04. Those expenditures, again, are outlined in your agenda item. One thing that I would like to point out is this is the final period of the fiscal year, but we don't close out the fiscal year until um, November, December time frame. So this isn't your actuals because I know I still have some outstanding invoices that will go to the 2021 fiscal year. Very good. Yeah. Are there any citizen comments? Any board questions on this? All right, I'm looking for a motion to approve the September 2021 financial statement for filing. Okay, can I hear the motion? Yes, I move to approve the September 2021 financial statement for filing. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, so it's uh, the motion is made by Shahab and seconded by Festus. Is there any discussion on this point? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it is passed. Thank you, Anne. You're welcome. Okay, next we have the uh, 4.3. Welcome, Jerry. The Hispanic Outreach Center update, Howard Smith. Good evening, board. Howard Smith, Business Assistant Administrator for the Community Redevelopment Agency. Last month, you as board members approved funding for the Hispanic Outreach, uh, doing business as the Intercultural Advocacy Institute for the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. And tonight, I have Andrea Vendetti here to give you all an update on the event, um, which was very well attended. So with that, if you have any questions, I would like to call up uh, Andrea to present the information and provide your response to any questions that you may have. Love to hear it. And there's also a short two-minute video that will play during her um, presentation. Very good. Cue that one quick. Andrea Vendetti with the Hispanic Outreach Center. And I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, event that we host. The Inter Intercultural Advocacy Institute hosted the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration in Square Station Park in September 23rd, 2001, 2021, with the participation of 125 guests. We would like to thank the Downtown Development Board for this opportunity and for their contribution to the event of more than $3,000. We want to give special thanks to Kenan Hitzel, who was present at the event. The event started with a musical presentation and a dance performance, followed by an award ceremony. Each year, the Hispanic Outreach Center and the Hispanic Leadership Council recognize outstanding agencies, partners, and individuals who made a difference in the community over the past year. This year, the Hispanic Outreach Center awarded key organizations and individuals for their efforts and support. Among the award receivers were local nonprofits, faith-based community members, donors, volunteers that helped with the food distribution that was held every week at the Hispanic Center during the pandemic. And we also recognize Pinellas County Health Department for taking action and bringing the vaccine closer to this vulnerable community. Our event also featured local Hispanic female artisans 
participants of the Hispanic Outreach Center jewelry class. They sell and make, they make and sell this jewelry, and they use this opportunity as a support and uh, to better their lives. And we had 12 female participants, artisans at the event, and they made uh, $178 with the, the sales at the event. After the conclusion of the ceremony, guests were invited to participate in the Dine Out for a Difference event at participating restaurants in the downtown area. The 10% of the proceeds benefit the ICIA Gabe Casares Memorial Scholarship that supports Hispanic students at St. Peterborough College. Each academic year, $2,000 in scholarship funds are awarded with preference to Hispanic Latino students demonstrating perseverance, academic accomplishment, and financial need. We are very happy to have been able to host this event for our families and community in a place that was safe, spacious, accessible, and welcoming to our community. Participants expressed their appreciation and gratification. And I would like to thank again the TDB for this opportunity. Thank you. I don't know if you have any questions about the event. You Great, saw the, I'm, I'm curious about the video. The video, and there was a lot of uh, performance, mm -hmm. dancers, and a lot of fun. So thank you again for this. Well, I'm very, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, we were able to assist with this, and I think I speak for uh, the entire board when I say that we're, we're very happy to see an increasing interest in the Hispanic community and participation in our downtown, and we welcome it. So consider us uh, in the future as well. Okay, thank you so much. I'd like to thank you. I got half my Christmas Christmas shopping done. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm curious. How, how many years have this been? Uh, the Hispanic Outreach Center. We have been in downtown Kiowa. These events. Oh, yeah. the event. Well, it's about we started 2008 with the Hispanic Leadership Council. We started offering this event as an open house in October, and it was also a celebration of the Hispanic Heritage Month. So last year we couldn't host the event because of the pandemic. So when we saw this opportunity to have it outdoors, it was just really great, and it was nice to see you know, the community again together and having fun and being able to enjoy and share. So it was very good. Are you planning to do it outside next year or are you do it back to indoors? I'm not sure. I think we liked it a lot, so we might consider it. Yeah. yeah. Yes, but we are planning um, a holiday event that we are writing a proposal also. Wonderful. For consideration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your participation. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item 4.4, and this is a presentation on the homeless situation in downtown Clearwater. <coughs> Gabe Parra from the city and Sergeant Fidelis from the Clearwater Police. Good afternoon. Hi. Gabe Parra. Uh, I work with the Economic Development and Housing Department, and uh, it is my pleasure today to give you a brief update uh, of the Homeless Initiative. What is the Homeless Initiative? Let's go back in time, year 2012. We had close to a little over 300 homeless persons uh, in the downtown corridor and all the way to the beach. They would start at the St. Vincent de Paul uh, soup kitchen, and uh, we have this very dire situation at the time. So the city decided to hire a consultant, uh, Dr. Robert Marvet. Uh, he has uh, lots of experiences in, in homelessness and issues like different municipalities. He, at the time, he had visited over 700 in municipalities and giving advice. So he came to the city and spent somewhere between two and three months, and even sometimes he spent part of the night at the homeless camps. He will kind of get in character, like a Hollywood actor, mm -hmm. and they will go and spend the night there. That is his way, according to him, that he will be able to get the direct answers from them instead of when they are interviewed, and, you know, they are kind of canned answers. He wanted to get the direct contact. 
So after his study of two or three months, he presented to city council a, a set of guidelines. He said, this is what he recommended. So that is what we call it the homeless initiative. There are several things uh, very important, all of them, of those guidelines. Uh, one of the more important ones is the realignment of magnets. At the time, we had feedings all over the city. Every corner there were churches, organizations providing meals. So the city allowed, and um, it was, you know, there are a lot of implications trying to stop people from feeding the homeless, you know, as you understand, there are many things to, to consider. So the city uh, allowed the feedings to take place at the vacant lab next adjacent to the police department. Uh, the only requirement is that the person uh, register with the city through me, and then they have to make sure that at the end they clean up. It is not that the homeless are responsible for the cleaning up, it is the organization that is providing the meals that needs to make sure that the lab is as clean as it was when they arrived. And uh, talking about uh, feedings, there is another one that is taking place right here in downtown, the uh, Peace Memorial Presbyterian Church. They have these feedings. Actually, they feed only once a week, but there are two other organizations that uh, get together and feed the other three days, uh, Mondays, Thursdays, Fridays, I think, and Sundays. So one of the issues that we have with the Peace Memorial feedings at this time is that the small building behind the church, which is the Peace Memorial Cafe, is going to be demolished. So I don't know exactly when, in the near future, so it won't be no more building where they used to have not only the meals, but also the cold night shelters happening at that particular building. That is gonna be demolished, and personally, I really don't know at this time what exactly is gonna be happening with the building in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, the cold night shelters will be held this time uh, somewhere at the Martin Luther King's Community Center, like it was last year because of the COVID, but um, we don't know what's going to happen with the feedings. We offer Peace Memorial that they are more than welcome to come and use the vacant lab uh, yes, to the police department. Another very important uh, guideline that came from the Homeless Initiative, uh, the, the guidelines that were presented uh, by Dr. Marbot, was the uh, funding that we provide. That is very important to know that the city does not provide any direct services to the homeless. The city provides funding to five continuum of care providers to service the homeless from the city of Clearwater. There are many uh, continuum of care providers in, in Clearwater, and I'm sorry, in Pinellas, but uh, the green side of the information card that I just left there, they have listed the five agencies that provide shelter and services to the homeless. So that is another very important result from the Homeless Initiative. So in a nutshell, that is the Homeless Initiative. I will have to have at least an hour to give you a little more in-depth uh, uh, overview of the Homeless Initiative. So any questions? Yeah, I have a question. I got that the Peace Memorial does one feeding a week, and an, an, another or other yeah, organizations do use several more? the same building. I think that one of them is the United Methodist Church. And, but they the feed them at Peace they Memorial. They feed there, right, they are the Peace Memorial. Okay. And there is a group of uh, Christian groups that get together and provide a meal another day of the week. So that's three or four three times? Three or four times a week, a week. yes, sir. And then who is doing the feeding at the 
you know, the lot across from the police station? Oh, there are several organizations, and a very good question, because one of the groups that feed at this particular lot come from Largo, mm. because it appears that it is easier to come here. They are allowed to do it. They have difficulties providing the meals in Largo, according to what they told me. So we have one group, an organization that come from Largo, and the other come from the area. That's interesting. And how many meals are provided at the at that lot per week? Oh, I really don't know. I don't have that data. Is it every day? Yes, yes. yes sir. It's lunchtime, and then at night, they're feeding them at night also. So 14 times a week. And uh, the soup kitchen does breakfast every morning. Okay, so they do get three meals a day if they show up for it? Every single day. Okay. Yeah, the soup kitchen provides meals every day of the week, okay. Sunday to Sunday. Okay. I had another question, but we'll see if anybody else does first. Yeah, I was curious, and this brochure uh, you spell out um, two specific uh, issues. Are these the main ones that uh, highlighted here, the, the main issues that uh, they, they create? Which ones are you talking about? Uh, street feeding without comprehensive service and handing out money and food and the doing behavior. These are the two, that gentleman who came out here. Uh, yeah, those came from uh, the initial visit from Dr. Robert Martin. Yes. And how, was, uh, how much of that recommendation has been implemented? I'm just curious. Oh, actually, uh, our homeless initiative, which is the, the whole set of the whole group of guidelines, uh, we really follow those guidelines very closely. Yes, it is very good because that number that we have, uh, usually the question that I've uh, been asked once, I mentioned that we had over 300 people in the year 2012, so the number uh, thanks to all of these guidelines and the help of the police department, have uh, been going down too. In October, we have a very good number, so I will let uh, Sergeant Fidelis to talk about the numbers that we have currently. Yes, sir. Do you find there's a bigger problem downtown than the beach, or is it a combination platter? Actually, that question. Uh, Sergeant Fidelis would be the best person to answer because he is patrolling sure. the city. Good right. afternoon, Sergeant Fidelis, Clearwater Police. Uh, the, the majority of the homeless people in the city of Clearwater are downtown. Uh, the, pretty much the corridor from Osceola heading east. Uh, there's some on the east side too, but the majority are located kind of central area. You get the bus station here, they can move along, and plus some of the feedings are done here too. So. Um, are there any more questions? Because I also have a part that I would like to present and maybe some questions after that. Do you, have, you said you had a question? Sir. Yeah, I've, well, you just generated another one. Okay. If the homeless people rely on the bus depot, where are they going to and from by bus, and why do they come back here? Um, obviously, there are resources here also. Uh, the mm -hmm. bus station to take them to Largo, the beach. Um, the feedings are here. Some of the services are uh, provided. So they're... A lot of reasons why they're here. Each individual has one, but I would say that uh, people from other states come here. You know, they want to see the area, and they happen to become homeless, or they just didn't plan ahead. That happens too. Uh, and there's some people who've been here for 20 years, so everybody has different reasons. But um, what I wanted to speak about is mm -hmm. what we're doing now. So, as all of you know, I've been in this position for four years. And absolutely, it's been one of the best positions I've had in my 18 years here. But I'm very excited about the future because um, Chief Slaughter provides an a environment for his officers, from an officer to everybody in his chain of command, to come up with solutions to issues. So I can, I'll admit it that I've made several mistakes in these four years. You know, uh, things change, and you want to do the best job you can, and sometimes you make a mistake, but. I'm actually very happy that I made those mistakes mm -hmm. because right now, the direction that we're going, I feel like will help the downtown area. Uh, imagine Clearwater. I was thinking ahead of those projects that we're creating here, and I wanted to set up a situation where we can 
set up a, a, a good environment for everyone. The city's spending a lot of money, a lot of business owners spend a lot of money here, people live here. We want to have quality of life. And also, for people that don't have homes, we want to try to improve their quality of life. So the direction that we're going is directions for a living uh, and the Clearwater Police Department are working together. And we have an outreach person. We had an outreach person before. Um, sometimes you have to have the right person. So right now we have the right person in that position. And that person, uh, her name is Kathy Hamm, and she works with my team directly. And my officers are very dedicated. They know every transient that's down here. We try to develop a good rapport with them. And with Kathy assisting us riding in the vehicle with us, uh, three times a week, what we do is we go to soup kitchens, we go to feeds, we drive around and locate people that are homeless. And what we've been doing, so in the, since August, we've had this project uh, restarted. And what we've been doing is we have been treating people as individuals. Um, so I, we approach somebody, we tell them who we are, we, I introduce Kathy, we ask them what they want to do. They want to just go to Safe Harbor, which is a shelter that anyone can go to, or they want a little more permanent housing, they want to go to Pinellas Hope, is really the main place that we've been sending them. Uh, so what Kathy does, she sits down with them, she gets on her database, she finds out multiple resources that, that person has. Again, if you treat somebody as an individual and say, look, what are your issues? You have an alcohol issue, you have a drug issue, you know, is there a mental health issue? What are the issues? And the reputation that she has, the credibility of her riding with us, and the, rep and the credibility of the officers that work uh, for me, um, has helped that people will open up to her. So not only are we getting them into Pinellas Hope, in fact, since August, we have permanently housed 62 people in Pinellas Hope, okay? In my opinion, that's a win. And most people say, well, then how come we still have the same number of transients down here? I have, a, I have an answer for that. So with the economy, everything that happened with the um, with COVID and people losing their homes, and now people are being evicted, right? Mm -hmm. So what's happened is that people are about to be homeless. They'll call us and they'll say, hey, I'm going to be homeless tomorrow. I'm going to be homeless next week. We I contact uh, Kathy Ham. She starts communicates with them, start talking to them about what we can do to help them. We're also not only putting people that are homeless into shelters, that that, are, that will help them specifically. Not just blanket, just you go here and never talk to you anymore. We follow up with them also. Um, but what we're doing is we're preventing people from being homeless by placing them before they even become homeless. Now, most people say, well, that's not a homeless person. Well, in my opinion, it is. If you're gonna be homeless tomorrow, you are homeless. So. Mm -hmm. It's thinking forward like that, and having the resources, obviously directions, Pinellas Hope, Safe Harbor, there's multiple resources that obviously are on a sheet. But I think is the approach is, let's treat people as individuals, let's try to assist them the best we can and make it a long-term commitment. You know, um, Chief Slaughter also has a mental health unit. Okay, we're gonna, the next step, we're, what I'm trying to do is do a, a net right now of getting as many people out of homeless as possible. We have people that are homeless, five, 10, 20, 30 years out here. We're gonna to try to do on ex parte, see if we can find family members to see if they'll sign ex parte to try to assist them if, if they wanna do that. If they have a mental health issue that you know is causing them to make, stay homeless, try to go that way. Um, developing a relationship with each individual, even if they don't want to be assisted today, there are people that are coming to us that been on the streets like 15 years, say, you know what, I heard what Kathy is doing and we want to work. We, I want to try. So also permanent housing is being set up too. She evaluates each person for homeless housing. If you're a vet, we try to get you resources. Also, there are children, there are mothers with children that are, are, being, are about to become homeless or are homeless. We go to them, we speak to them, evaluate them, and we don't give up until they're at least placed in a hotel and we start working on what's, what's going to be next for them. Mm -hmm. So I am super proud of the effort that my team has had and obviously uh, the, the resources that Directions and other uh, organizations are doing. So I think that will help everyone, business owners downtown, citizens in Clearwater, and obviously the people that are currently homeless due to uh, multiple factors. I'm pleased to hear all that. It's very well done. Yeah, it's, 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 I can't say that it's a team that I can't. This is more than a team effort. This is getting down there and talking to the person, mm -hmm. treating them like they're important. And when they feel that, 
so that people see that and they tell people that they're actually really wanting to help them. So we're leading the entire county in putting people into um, housing. So again, very proud of that. Very good. I have a question. Uh, out of the, uh, you didn't mention how many, uh, what the current count is from. So um, last <coughs> month, last month, excuse me, the month before was 91. Huh? Okay. Wow. But with this effort, we have 73. <gasps> That's uh, excellent. I, I, I truly believe that I think we can reduce that number even further by the end of the year. Um, and we're really working hard to do that. Uh, and the thing that I found interesting is that Pinell, when they go to Pinellas Hope, they get a tent. Uh, they have other options there, too, and other services, but I don't see them coming back. It, I think I've seen maybe two out of the 62 that we've placed there. They're not coming back. So following up, too, is important. We provide them cell phones. The ones that we don't give them shelter, uh, Directions provides them a cell phone and bus passes so they can get to work. They still commute to work. And we can contact them and say, look, we have a housing for you. We have an opportunity for you. My officers also transport people. Today, we put seven people into Pinellas Hope and one into the HEP. But we transport most people down there. They don't have transportation or the buses don't run that early or whatever. We drive and pick them up and take them there. And again, we, we treat them as fairly as possible. We, we definitely, and they appreciate that. You know, sometimes they want to hug Kathy. We're not, we're not doing the hugging yet, but, you know, it's, it, I, I, I can see that people are like, well, these people work so hard to get me into the show. Let me see what I can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very proud of this direction. I think it will be very helpful in the future. Okay. Amanda? I wanted to add in that the Community Redevelopment Agency funds for two additional police officers in downtown, and we also provide additional funding for this mental health and social service component. So there is CRA money that's we're partnering with the police um, to help with this issue. Um, also, we are removing the blue tables and chairs off of the 400 and 500 blocks of Cleveland Street. So moving forward, there won't be any public uh, tables and chairs there, and we'll be reopening Station Square Park um, right before Thanksgiving for the holiday season and programming that. So those are other things, too, that I know impact businesses and, and where people experiencing homelessness gather. Okay. I had uh, one one more question to do. That's first of all, that's a remarkable change from 300 down to 72. Um, I'm just wondering, out of that 72, how many of them are people that are that want to maintain their situation of being homeless, like they they won't they won't participate, and how many of them are there because you lack the resources to place them? Well, I would say that half of those people want to stay homeless, mm -hmm. and I would say half of that would be people that are, have mental health issues that, again, you know, the second phase of this effort, we're really going to sit down with those individuals and see if we can locate families wherever they are in the country and communicate with them, look, this is the situation, these are the documentation that we've had with your relative. Um, you know, there's some people that obviously use narcotics, there's some people that have alcohol issues that they just don't want help. They, you know, um, and obviously we address those issues when they occur, but we don't give up on them. We still tell them that, you know, they're worth something and that we can try to turn this around. Um, I think that approach, again, numerous mistakes that I made, you know, in this mm -hmm. role, um, but they know that we are here, we want to help them, we don't want them to be homeless, and every contact is, we can get you here, I can get you here. You know, I've come off, you know, off duty and put somebody in, in, in a placement before too. They call me and like, hey, I want to go right now. Oh, you want to go? I'm coming. So it's, they see those efforts and then they say, you know what, let me at least try. And mm -hmm. you know, the success, success rate um, is hard to gauge just because some people will stay and some people will come back the same day. So, you know, but that effort I think is, is a good direction. Okay. Now you mentioned that half of them don't want to get out of that situation, but the half to do, is that a resource problem that's preventing um, that from being taken well, care of? There, there's the resources, yes. There could be more resources in the county, mm -hmm. right? But we also have an issue where if you haven't been here more than six months in count, in the county, you don't qualify to get in some of these shelters. Now, Safe Harbor, you can be up 72 hours, but if you just move from Kansas and you want, and you're homeless here, and you want to go to a permanent shelter, then you don't qualify to go into Pinellas Hope, and obviously 72 hours of Safe Harbor is not really doing much. So there's some of that. We definitely 
Um, we also work with uh, the Going Home Project. So if somebody's here from another state or anywhere else, we can assist them in getting back to where they're from. Mm -hmm. And that is something that um, on the beach I had two in one day, got them back to New York City. But I, I approached a person at 10.30, at 2.30 they were on the bus. You know, the Going Home Project is fantastic has really helped with some of the people that don't want to go to shelters mm -hmm. and then we contact their families say, hey look we'll take them back provide a bus they provide a the going home project provide a bus pass or an airline ticket we actually drive them to the bus station or the airport and um provide them that that assistance so okay i'm asking a lot of questions because i have a, a deep personal interest in this because yes sir i've had to deal with Homeless for we the last continue, 30 years. Uh, yeah. My team and I continue to come in early in the morning. We try to get here around 6 o'clock in the morning. We do business checks. Um, I walk Cleveland every single day that I'm working. My mm -hmm. officers are also instructed to do that. And we check the businesses. We make sure that people aren't sleeping there. If we are, we help them with these services. But um, and I'm not going to say there's not going to be homeless anymore. I'm not going to say it's going to be doing without a 10 to 15. I'm, I'm not naive to think that. But the effort of Preventing you from being homeless, I think, is big. And also, uh, having the reputation that we help people is also a big win for us, for the city, you know, as a whole. Yeah, I can uh, I can attest to the fact that it's a much safer environment downtown, and that crime is, for, from my perspective, is like maybe five percent of what it was 20, 25 years ago. So it's enormously improved. Even though some of the same faces are still around. Patrick and I are buddies yes. for 25 Patrick, years. Yes. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, he, he, him and I have a really good relationship. If I ask him something, he usually assists me, and I, I, I try to do the same for him. Yeah. Um, and then just to close my presentation, um, this will be my last presentation. I'm going to have a replacement starting in January. I'm going to be going um, to another, another position. So it was more than a pleasure to work with all of you. And uh, I... I was saying, I'm excited to see what downtown's going to look like in the future. Right. Well, you're not leaving the department. Though. No, sir. No, sir. Right. That's good. Thank okay. Well, good luck in your new position. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For your Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any? I think the chairman asked pretty much. Yeah, you asked all of them. I'm very impressed. Uh, yeah. I really thank thank you for taking the time to come let us know what you're doing. It, it is of interest. Thank you. And uh, it's definitely not just me. My, my officers, every officer in the, in the police department actually knows about these resources. They'll email us information, and we jump right on helping people from all the way by US-19 and Gulf of the Bay to downtown. So. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe, too. Thank you. OK, we'll move on to item 4.5. Um, we spent a lot of time on that, but I have a, a deep and abiding personal interest mm. there. Uh, Ann Lopez. 2021 DDB election results. Good evening again. Ann Lopez, CRA Program Specialist. Um, this agenda item is to provide you an update on your 2021 Downtown Development Board election results. Um, you had three candidates run for two seats that will be expiring. Um, currently, we're with Caitlin Jamo and Festus Porbeni. You had three candidates. Caitlin Jamo, Festus Porbeni, and Scott Sousa. And I'm happy to announce that Festus Porbeni had 225 votes, Caitlin Jamo had 190 votes, and Scott Sousa had 111. So congratulations to Caitlin and Festus. Um, we'll be in touch next month to do some orientation, which you're familiar with. Um, there were a total of 275 ballots that qualified. There were 11 envelopes that were not qualifying because they had either an invalid signature or they were late or they had more than the allotted votes. Um, so these, this term will begin in January of 2022 and I'd like to thank Member Keenan and Howard for assisting me this year with this year's election. Great. Questions? Congratulations to the uh, winners. Thank you. Any questions? No, I think, uh, oh, I, I, the, the fact that there's still 11 people's votes that didn't ca get mm -hmm. counted it means we still have work to do on trying to make it more clear, the process on how to vote and how to, to remain eligible. 
we, we've reduced that number, I think, from yes. prior years. Yes, last year there was, I think it was 33. Mm -hmm. um, so from last year having 33 and only 11 this year, you know, I think we made, we made Significant a good problems. step. Um, yeah. But yeah, we'll have to look at it next year to see, you know, if there's a way that we can send out a reminder earlier in the year about, you know, don't forget the elections coming up. If you need a reminder of who your designated voter registration is, you know, please contact CRA That's staff. That's the main right? reason, right? Yes. The wrong person signs. Yes. You know, if, if my spouse and I, I sign it listing myself as the voter designee, but my husband signs it, the envelope doesn't count. Mm. Yeah. And that's what That's unfortunate. This year. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to item 4.6. We have a funding request from the Hispanic Farmers Market. Howard? Good evening, board. Howard Smith, um, Business Assistant Administrator for the CRA. So the purpose of this item is to recommend approval of the Clearwater Hispanic Farmers Market funding request to manage and operate a weekend market, weekend outdoor market for six months, which will start from November 2021 through April of 2022. The outdoor market will take place at 710 Court Street with, spe with a special events permit approval um, following COVID safety protocols. The purpose of the Clearwater Hispanic Farmers Market is to bring a unique market to downtown Clearwater that celebrates Hispanic heritage through a series of cultural experiences at each event. The market will feature traditional homemade crafts, fruits, and vegetables. It will also have live music performance from folklore groups, uh, fashion shows, live music, and also singing contests. This market will provide a family-friendly family atmosphere to allow residents, visitors to downtown and the Clearwater community exposure to the Hispanic culture through live music, through live entertainment, Latin food, unique gift items, and traditional merchandise. The, mar the Clearwater Hispanic Farmers Market has completed a weekend market in downtown last month at the same location, and it anticipated attracting approximately 300 plus visitors to the market and downtown Clearwater each month for each event. The market will be open to the public starting at 9 a.m. and will end at 3 o'clock p.m. on the third weekend of each month. The Clearwater, Clearwater Hispanic Farmers Market is requesting funding to, to support operational expenses associated with, mark, with managing and producing 12 markets, two weekends for six months. The operating costs include city permitting fees, live music, sanitation, um, marketing, and operational staff to clean the area for pre- and post-events. Um, the Clearwater Hispanic Farmers Market is also seeking um, initial funding to cover city expenses for the first two months, which amounts to $6,770, and, and the remainder of the funding will be used to cover the other operational costs. Um, staff recommends funding this market series as it aligns with the Downtown Development Board 2021 work plan to fund the production of markets of various special events throughout the DDB district, which will increase the awareness of downtown as a tourist destination. And also pending approval, uh, the Hispanic Farmers Mark will complete a grant agreement that outlines and details each event and the marketing benefits uh, for the DDB as part of their grant request. And for this, uh, funds for this grant are available from the DDB's fiscal year 21-22 budget. And per the DDB funding policy, um, this $24,000 request is less than its $75,000, which is 30% of the DDB's $250,000 marketing budget. And for this event, I have Dina Ramos, their director, here to answer any questions that you all may have. And we provide you the budget and all of our funding requests um, with this. So with that, I would like to call up um, the director, Dina Ramos. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dina Ramos. <laughs> and uh, I am one of the directors, one of the administrators for the Clearwater Hispanic Farmers Market. And so it's a vision that uh, to help um, the Hispanic community to celebrate the heritage, to celebrate the legacy, to celebrate the accomplishments of this community that is in the midst of, you know, Clor um, Florida, clear water. And so we are looking to provide so much more than the uh, farmer's market, the vegetables, the fruits, and uh, um, the artisan, the woodwork, and all of this. We are actually um, uh, creating um, 
uh, a place where not only is offers a cultural experience for everyone, diversity, and welcomes, it celebrates people, but at the same time, it builds um, a sense of community and it builds a sense of bonding, a family uh, um, atmosphere that creates um, um, a, a place where um, children are attracted, you know, uh, having a good time. We have games, we have singing contests for the children, um, we have different attractions that uh, it just celebrates people and it helps them have a good time. And so we are dog friendly, we have dog treats, and so we create an atmosphere that uh, it attracts and celebrates people. And we are very, very proud of it, and uh, um, we welcome all cultures, and, uh, but um, we are focusing on celebrating the Hispanic heritage, and uh, it's, it's, it was amazing. In October, we had great, great feedback, and uh, it was celebrating lots of people. The vendors' applications have doubled, and uh, we are looking to have um, programs like for um, different um, humanitarian needs, like for example, for single mothers or workshops, how to um, teach people how to um, start up businesses. So we're looking to provide uh, people for a startup or an additional um, uh, income that they can help themselves. And so uh, it, it provides a place where um, people can actually have a platform to jump off for um, store uh, front businesses, and, uh, and and so we are looking to have performances by children, young people and children, where they can uh, have a place where they can um, uh, express and uh, perform their singing contests, dancing contests, and uh, and uh, art that uh, expressions. And so it's it's a place that uh, it's a unique farmers market because it's more than um, vegetables and, and fruits. Questions, anyone? I'm curious. Uh, <clears throat> how many Hispanic or Latinos live in Clearwater? In Clearwater, uh, we have, um, I believe that it's about 20%. 19, I think, was the last count. 19, 20%. Yeah. So we're looking at a fair number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we have a um, population of about a, what, a million? About 25,000. Yeah, so, that's, in two, what is it? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Steve? Go ahead, okay. Kina. Um, is this the first endeavor of the, your event, or is it coming from previous successes? Well, we actually, the five administrators that uh, um, are overseeing the, this project are pretty much um, um, pastors and leaders, and so we have each one of them does do have um, uh, experience in community events. So we grew out of uh, that desire to, to reach out to the community. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the, uh, the estimated income indicates that you're expecting 40 vendors at each one. Is that how many did you have at the last one, and how many do you think you'll have at the uh, next one? The last one, we had 15. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, we have 30 uh, vendors' applications that have come in, so okay. doubled. And so by the time that uh, uh, the next event comes around, we expect um, a lot more than 40. So that's a real number? Yes. Yeah, okay. And I have a, a follow-up question. Uh, your, your marketing budget is for uh, social media and other marketing is $300 an event. Right. And uh, I think considering the, the size of the budget, it's a very small fraction of your budget. Considering you're, you're only expecting 300 people to show up, if you doubled or tripled your marketing, oh, you, might, right. yeah. It, yeah. It, you might get a lot more uh, people coming. Um, yeah. Because if there's 20 or 30,000 Hispanics in Clearwater, 300 isn't a very big number. Um, well, um, we are expecting more as we're growing, mm -hmm. so um, we, we take in flight, and so we are actually expecting more than that, but uh, uh, realistically, um, this past um, event, we had between 250 and $300, and it was just barely 15 vendors, and it was the very first one. So uh, um, we have had a great, aggressive, a big um, approach for publicity 
in marketing. And so um, with all the uh, Telemundo uh, reporter that came over, the Tampa Bay Times, uh, the ABC Action News, and uh, the, all the community events that uh, calendars that we have been um, 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 advertising. So um, we are expecting to that number to grow very okay. rapidly. OK. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly big ask you're making of us. Mm -hmm. And we want to, just speaking for myself anyway, I, I would like to support you and have a farmer's market succeed in Clearwater. Um, in exchange for this money, I would like to ask you to, to increase your marketing reach out into the public as much as you can mm -hmm. so that we get a bigger return in terms of number of people being brought to downtown. Absolutely. Well, okay. um, we're looking um, at the stage master. The stage master, master the, the platform, it is a big um, expense and is key to have the performances. Mm -hmm. So we have three different folklore groups of children that are dancing, that are singing, that are going around the stage. And so people were gathering around the stage to watch this, and they would bring in the um, chairs. And some of them, most of them, were sitting on the grass. And so um, that is one of the biggest expenses, the police and the uh, stage master. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, I think uh, the biggest expense they have is the city. I mean, it's more than half of their expenses is the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, but he's right. If you want to do well, you should promote and let more people know that $300 yes. is Absolutely. Uh, it's a very tiny budget. Yeah. Um, unless you don't know how to utilize the marketing budget or don't know where to spend it. Well, um, we're definitely willing to learn. And to uh, uh, ideas, suggestions, absolutely. But uh, we do have a great graphic designer, and uh, this person is uh, um, has designed the logos, the posters, the um, social media, the website, and uh, we are um, partnering. Um, we have um, been able to get sponsors and uh, and promote um, in that manner. So. Um, it's, it's a great push, it's a great uh, work that we're doing. But yes, absolutely, most definitely, um, we need more. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay, I think, uh, are there any citizen comments on this matter? Okay, I think we were um, ready to ask for a motion. Does anyone want to make a motion regarding this funding request? I, I will. I move to approve the uh, $24,000 funding for the market. Very good. Do we have a second? Ray Casano. So Keenan makes the motion. Ray seconds. Is there any discussion? Any further discussion? Do they keep a list of what the uh, money is spent on so that we know? Yes. Howard, can you answer yeah. that one for us? He can give us more detail. Sorry, what was your question? Is there a list that is kept of where the money is spent that we approve? So we know where it's gone. Yes. Yeah, so for the refunding, well, for the reimbursement process, they will submit they will submit a detailed list of their expenses. In addition to that, they will have a spreadsheet. So we will only work on a reimbursement basis okay. uh, for them. So for their expenses that they submit, we will reimburse them, and we will have that total not to exceed the twenty four thousand dollars. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, while you're still here, uh, and that. This will be divided up on a monthly basis, so each yes. month will have a certain amount. Yes. Right, okay. Any other questions? Okay, then we will call the question for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Congratulations and good luck with it. Thank you <laughs> very much. We hope to hear great things about it. You sure will. Okay. Great. Okay, and now uh, item 4.7. We have a funding request from Lena Teixeira Productions. Howard, you're taking this one? Yes, that's been good. Um, Howard Smith, Business Assistant Administrator for the Community Redevelopment Agency. So the purpose of this item is to present a grant request for Lena Teixeira Productions for market assistance to fund an art exhibit showcasing local trash collected um, from the Big City Clamp event that took place last month on October 16th, which was a citywide initiative with Ocean Allies, Amplify Clearwater, um, keep Pinellas beautiful and also the city of Clearwater. Bless you. 
Um, Lena Chichara Production is proposing to contract with local artists to create a unique art piece using up to 80% of the trash uh, to construct art exhibits from the big city cleanup. <clears throat> this unique art piece will be on display locally at downtown buildings up to six months with rotating art pieces every other month between locations. Funding for the art exhibits will be used to market exhibits, cover operational costs to uh, prep sites for installation and removal of exhibits, and also artist curation and artist curation in the DDB district area only. Art exhibits shall be removed from all downtown buildings by May 3rd, 2022, and um, display locations must be secured prior to receiving funding. So with that, you would have to get approval to have the art at any of the city located buildings. The DDB will, list it, uh, will be listed for sponsorship in addition to promoting all activities for recyclable art exhibits that identifies the DDB as a sponsor with logos on marketing materials created by Lena Tashara Productions, but not limited to, should include, but not limited to signage and also promotional images. This request does align with the DDB work plan goal to fund the production and marketing of a variety of events throughout the DDB district that increases awareness of downtown as a tourist destination and to increase awareness of downtown as a fun destination for the city of Clearwater's residents, employees, and visitors. Since this grant application, um, excuse me, since this grant applic applicant is a candidate for the current uh, council race, uh, the Surrey staff cannot make a recommendation on this item. Uh, and with that, if approved, um, Lenny Tichara Productions will complete a fund agreement that would outline the outlines the reimbursement process for approved expenses associated with recyclable materials and outline sponsorship of the DDB. For this um, funding request, fund grants are available in the DDB's fiscal year budget um, for marketing. And per the DDB funding policy, this $6,000 request is less than the $75,000, which is 30% of the DDB's $250,000 marketing budget. And for tonight, I have Michael um, Montini here to be able to answer any questions uh, that you may have. He is one of the um, artists that will be working on this project. With that, I'd like to call it Michael. Good evening. I'm uh, Michael Montini. I'm one of the uh, contributing artists. So if there are any questions. Okay. I have some questions, but we'll all go last. Um, I'm curious. Um, it says a third party contributions. Uh, Two thousand uh, dollars. What is that third party? Who, who's providing that? Do you know? Yeah, that I don't know. I can get that answer to you. Though. Do you know Howard? Um, from my understanding, I talked with Lena. I know that she is contributing, and I believe um, she's also working. Um, I can't think of the name of the, the organization. Um, the Arts Alliance, I believe. And they are, need her to confirm they're going exactly. to fund this for $2,000? I believe so, but Lena would have to confirm that, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, if they're funding or are they going to basically do $2,000 worth of work? I do not have an answer. That. But with that, we would outline that information, so we will follow up with you. If that's a question that you need a response to be able to approve the request, then we will be able to provide that to you. Uh, yeah, I think so. Go ahead, Kenan. Um, I'm not an artist. I appreciate what you do. I know art is in the eye of the beholder, and uh, Amanda was kind enough to invite me to be part of the Art Alliance, and I got to witness true artists debating art for a couple hours. So uh, what I've seen thus far in the city is fantastic with what Amanda's done with the mur murals and all that. I have a hard time imagining trash as art. Maybe you could enlighten or show samples or, I, you know, to bring, I just don't know. What yeah. So. Um, I know that uh, out of the 10 contributing artists, uh, one of the pieces will be a wearable art piece. Uh, we do have a wearable art that's uh, down the district here in the windows that you can see where um, odd items or miscellaneous items are put together as a wearable art. Uh, the piece that I'm working on is raising awareness to uh, plastics and the ocean pollution and um, where I have plastic bags that simulate jellyfish, uh, which is what actually happens out in, in, into the environment. And, it's just, it's art, uh, there's sculptures that are, the trash will just be compiled into, and I, I'm not saying this for sure, but it'll be compiled into a turtle or a sailfish or whatever else. So it'll be ocean themed? Majority of it is ocean themed. And would Amanda's our reigning art director have final say-so, so? so. <laughs> 
Um, I think there's still some unknowns about, I mean, the artists are going to make what the artists are going to make, different than a CRA commissioned work. Um, I will not have an opinion on this work um, because I'm not the funder, uh, or the CRA is not the funder. Um, but I think the locations are still to be determined of where it would be displayed. Um, so the owners of those sites might have some opinions. Obviously, the materials available, we don't know what, I mean, we know there's a lot of plastic that's been collected Correct. because plastic is what the litter is, but to, is exactly what those materials are, um, we wouldn't, wouldn't know yet, so. Um, we got another question over My here. bag has flip-flops, a hat, cigarette butts, a lot of bottles. <laughs> there's a number there of things, go. flotation devices, yeah. But I do believe that you can make something visually interesting yes. out of, uh, trash, and there's been projects like that all over the United States. It's not, it's not a new idea. Okay. Okay. We had another question over there. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to have the comment about uh, trash becoming art. Uh, last year at a city council meeting, I, I brought up a, a particular artist who who comes to town and spends a week with locals gathering. Uh, and turning it into a really nice art project. And Amanda said that, well, she actually worked with it in the past or uh, was well aware of it. So I don't have a problem personally with the fact that this is doable. Um, I'm a little concerned, um, and I suppose this is nothing major, but uh, how much of this money is actually going to, to Lena? Because I know she's, she's got uh, her own artwork in the windows now for the project that she worked on. Uh, is she the curator? Uh, is she marketing and promotion? Uh, and the name of her company is uh, Lena Teixeira Productions, not Art for Life Productions, for example. Um, so I'm just kind of curious as to where the money's going. But I think it's you know it's it's a it's a small amount, and I, uh, you know it seems like a reasonable thing. I just have the uh, wearable art exhibit, the CRA commissioned Lena Teixeira Productions to do that. So we specifically hired her um, to just, so it's very clear <laughs> mm -hmm. for the public, the CRA did hire her as we've commissioned Jazz Holiday, we've commissioned Urban Conga, um, because that's, a, she served as a curator and as an artist because that's a medium that works to, works great and displays as retail display windows. Um, so. She was paid for her services, and she was commissioned. She did not seek that funding. That is something that we sought her out, as we do from time to time, for various artists for various purposes. Mm -hmm. well, just to clarify, what does uh, I'm, not, I'm just not clear from I'm, I haven't been in this area before, so I'm just curious what curating costs are. Like, what does it cost to curate, and what does it mean to curate? I don't even know what that means. That I won't be able to answer, but I think you should answer. I'm sorry, I won't be able to answer. Curator right, at a museum goes out and finds the specific pieces to create a collection. So that's the person that selects the. Generally. Mm -hmm. And it's been, the term's been watered down a lot. You know, like everyone's a programmer, everyone's a curator, everyone's, but essentially when you're in that role, you are responsible for the overall look feel, theme, production, right, of a particular exhibition, whether that's indoors or outdoors in multiple places in one place, you're selecting the artists, as the mayor said, and guiding them in the theme of the work. Um, what I would say is what you have, what we sent out in advance, that's all the information that we have. Um, if you need more information to feel comfortable with this decision, then, you know, we will collect those questions and we can we would move it to another meeting. Um, okay. Keenan? Um, I mean, I would attest to Lena's prowess in this area, not that I'm an artist again, but she's passionate and productive nice. and did fill up a lot of empty windows for a long time with cool stuff. You'd be the curator? Is that what I understood? I, I'm, not, I'm just one of the contributing artists. You're a contributing artist, Correct. okay. And there'll be how many? Ten. Uh, ten. Ten. So... Uh, Ms. Teixeira would serve as the curator. Okay. I mean, yeah. she has a track record of doing different projects. It's just more my concern was that I didn't know art 
from trash was a thing. It's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend of mine picks up uh, broken pieces of glass on the sand when we go for a walk and melts them out and make them into an art. So that's mm -hmm. trash. Turn it Very good. Okay. Um, Quick question, sorry. Um, in terms of the locations, it says they're still to be determined. Are, are they up for approval or just has been provided by Lena, the locations for the art? To my understanding, it's uh, contingent on approval. So, uh, art, or the, the, uh, I'm sorry, the display uh, will be both uh, municipal and also uh, private. Well, I'm interested, but it would be good to get some questions answered. It would be wonderful to have a little bit more, but I'm personally interested. Okay. Are there, before we consider the actual request, are there any more questions to ask of the presenters? Okay, are there any citizen comments on this issue? Okay. So what I'm looking for now is a motion regarding LTP funding request for six thousand dollars. Is there someone that would like to make a motion? I move to approve the fund request for LTP for market assistance, the amount of six thousand. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a, a motion by Festus, a second, a second by Keenan, and now we're opening it up for discussion. Is there any discussion? Would anyone like to make? Yes, uh, actually, uh, again, as I said, I'm very interested. Mm -hmm. But it'd be good to get some questions answered. But yeah, well, let's fund it. But just be good what to get some questions. questions. Um, yeah, w what is that? When you're curating, what, what are we doing? Are we going? Uh, the, the curator is going to go bid the art with you guys to buy it, or you guys are just doing it out of just for fun? Uh, yeah, a lot of the art is, you know, from passion. Yeah, so. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so you're saying you would have helped if Lena was here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we get to see her, but she's <laughs> probably busy. Okay, okay one, one second. I think Ray was first. We'll yeah. Um, is there a way we could fund it, but give you partially, like half of it, and see what it looks like and stuff, and then... <laughs> Because I'm in a mystery myself, too. Yeah. Need more information. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. So you want to see the art first? Uh, I'd like to see a couple pieces, you know. Oh. Is she not in art? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do have one more question. Uh, have you guys contemplated, maybe you, you uh, pass it on to Lena, that uh, afterwards put up the art uh, as an auction for sale to generate some income for further ones? or? Yeah. yeah. We do have, with the wearable art, uh, we do have um, some of it is priced uh, for sale. I will say that a uh, majority of the wearable art uh, in the windows there, my piece especially, is all recycled materials. So it's, uh, everything was upcycled. Um, so I would say out of all the pieces there, majority of them are <clears throat> upcycled or work from trash. Okay, I think we have some input from our attorney. Would you come up to the podium, please? I always look up on some biz when somebody makes a funding request, and um, this is not registered on the Secretary of State side as either a corporation or a fictitious name, so that would have to be dealt with before anything, mm -hmm. any contract was finalized. Okay. Don't, don't leave just yet. I have a question for you. I don't know what curating means either. I don't know how far I came. <laughs> I did the research, got nowhere. <laughs> no, no, just procedurally, we have a motion before us. We have some requests to defer a decision. What is the correct method to proceed? Do we call the vote and have it fail, or do we you, do if, something else? There are two ways you could do it. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest is you call the vote on this motion. And if it doesn't have enough votes, it fails, and someone can make another motion. The other way is the person who made the motion can withdraw it with the consent of the second. They both have to agree, and and then a new motion can be made. Okay. okay. So um, e either one is appropriate. Okay. Okay. 
I don't know that that's the case, but uh, you had another comment? I see this going forward because it's going to be cool, but uh, I just, since you're the artist, my wife has this garage filled with things, and you are welcome to any of it on the record. <laughs> okay. So, you started with the motion. Okay, no, it's uh, fastest made the motion. And uh, did you want to do anything with the motion or leave it as is? As is. As is. Okay, so then we're going to, is there any additional discussion? Okay, so all in favor, say aye. Aye. Good. Okay, so and any opposed? Okay, and uh, I'm, I'm opposed only on the basis of um, I would like to see more data and hear from the applicant themselves. I, I do like the idea of the project, but... Uh, I think as to go forward, we have to have a, I guess, as she, uh, she pointed out, we have to have a business... Uh, Right. Um, okay. All so the locations will all have to be in the DDB district as right. well. So the, the motion passes. Yep. So this is approved. It's four to two. No. Four. It's four to two, as far as I can tell, right? So the motion does pass. Thank you very much. Okay, and now we're on item 4.8. Amanda, would you oh, take the lead for us, please? Yes. Okay, Amanda Thompson, CRA Director. It's great to see you all again. And Ray, to keep make sure I get you here too. Um, so, really, two things wanted to discuss today, and I know our meeting's running long, so I don't want to belabor points. Um, but short term, we just want to make sure we're providing clarity as people are coming in with funding requests around grants. And then long term, we want to make sure that the funding priorities and processes align with the DDB goals, um, right? So that we're doing what you expect out of us and getting the information um, that you need. Also, we'll get to the downtown coordination group, but they have some ideas and conversations about funding. And then the CRA, we're in the process of developing what will probably end up being three grant programs that'll be providing funding as well, special events um, being one of those that we're kind of honing in as we're listening to all the different groups and going through this process on where is the CRA funding really needed. Um, you know, our goal being that there's something happening every week in downtown, right? Some, whether that small, large, that there's always activity, there's always a reason to come downtown. Special events are a big part of that. Um, so where can we fit in for that? And I think the Hispanic farmer's market is just a really clear, compelling example of, of what it cost, right, to put on even a very simple, um, by any measure, activity that there's some significant cost to that. So in, in the short term, um, these are the two things we really need to know. Are you willing to fund the same applicant more than once? Are you willing to fund more than 30% of the yearly budget amount in a category? When would those situations be that you would be? Because what we heard at the previous meeting was um, maybe you don't want the same people coming and asking for money twice. So we want to get really clear on that. Um, if you only want to fund an entity one time, if that's the way you're leaning, we, we need to know that um, so we can communicate that. In one year or uh, in the following year? In one fiscal year. One fiscal year. So this is the October, starting October through September of next year. Are you asking for a decision on that I, this month? I am asking for your feedback right now, yes. Right now. <laughs> well, I'm not asking for payments for once every month. That is, uh, well, I guess we're approving 12 payments. Well, that's one request spread out over a year. Yeah, it's one. That's, that's different than 12 different requests. Yeah, they, it's different than them coming back and asking for more money. Um, right, so for example, the, his, the Intercultural Advocacy Institute, also called the Hispanic Outreach Center, they just presented back on their event. They're also considering coming back to the DDB to ask about a holiday event. Mm -hmm. Right, so now we're in a situation where do we tell them you, you had your one time and we're really looking for other applicants or should they come back and ask? Um, yeah, I think, no, I think we have to be careful with this because I've um, been here quite a while and haven't seen that many people come out to 
great ideas for events. So we have to be careful not to just bottleneck, bottleneck ourselves into just one, one time a year. What if uh, a group puts up a great successful event and they want to come back in three months? They're going to say no because they've asked one time but had a great event. So we have to be very careful not to just do that. We have to really think about it. I agree with Festus on that one. Uh, we have had people that were starting out in their initial they put on an event, it worked, then they came back and put on some more events and it worked, and eventually we transitioned them into larger, longer term requests. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, uh, just I'm have an arbitrary amenable. limit is uh, non-productive. Yeah, I'm amenable for them to come back again. I mean, at the worst case, okay. we say no. Okay. That's true. Um, I wouldn't want to arbitrarily limit it. I think we, we have the right to say no at any time. Right. Okay, so it really is for you more about a total amount of money than going to one group? Because then we get down to the 30%, because how that works in practice is that someone will say, aha, like I know I want to do 12 events, right, over a year, so I'm going to come with one ask, and I'll get all 12 times covered, but that's going to be a larger request than, say, coming every other month or every three months, right, asking for a smaller amount of money yeah. at a time. I think maybe the way around <laughs> that is if when that's presented to us or sent, you know, sent attached to us in our package, if it's accompanied with a note from Howard, this this puts them over the the thirty thousand or thirty percent limit. I, I mean, the uh, Latino group coming and asking for one thing and coming for another event, which is completely different thing as a holiday event versus a farmers mm -hmm. market. They're two different functions. Well, just uh, just thing. as a counterpoint to that, th I, I agree with you there, but the whole discussion on the 30% on the came about because the DCMA came to us and asked us for money and then came back and asked for more money. Yeah. And that's and it was for something, you know, it wasn't the winter event, it was the Christmas event, or yeah, I'm just making it up, but it was something different. So it seems inconsistent to, to apply the rule on yeah. one and not on the other. Well, if they're successful, and the second time they come back, we could be amenable to give them more money. But that doesn't answer her question. No, th this is, this is <laughs> answering my question. You know, we just want to make sure we're not penalizing someone when we're trying to encourage them to be organized, right? Yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. saying we want you to plan ahead. You know, we want you to plan out a year so you can work with special events, you have more time for marketing, you can have this bigger impact. Well, they plan ahead and they come with a bigger ask, then we don't want them to be punished for that, so to speak, mm -hmm. because the amount's bigger, um, right? So I, I think what I'm hearing is you are open to different groups coming with multiple smaller asks as they figure things out, figure out how they can be successful. Um, you are open to considering larger ask and multiple ask. Again, if the group can show that something's working, mm -hmm. Um, so it's a small amount of money is okay for experimentation and first time out, um, and larger amounts of money, you really just want to see that it's, it's being effective, but there's no hard yes or no's either way. I agree with that. I agree. I think it helps us as a board, it helps us to approve something if it's, if it's some, an unknown quantity, an unknown group, to see a couple of successful small things before we approve right. a longer range thing. So, to have a limit on you had to you should have asked us for a whole year. No, we wouldn't have approved a whole year because we didn't know who you were. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not sure. Can you guys see the presentation on your screen? Mm -hmm. Down there, because I'm not sure why it's not showing on the TVs. We can see that. Um, public. Who? Thank you, public comms. <laughs> um, so moving forward, um, as we you know look at well, looking at the work plan, looking at the work of the downtown groups and our grant programs, um, you know, one question I have for you, and you don't have to answer this one today, is would the DDB be willing to consider a program specifically for marketing of a special event when no city permit is needed? Um, that your money would be limited specifically to marketing. Not sure what that meant. So that would be, example? in the case of the Hispanic Outreach Center, well, they, they need, um, I mean, they need a permit, but let's say, like, the Sip and Stroll or a lot of the DCMA activities, they don't require city permits. 
Um, so you could say, look for every kind of event that you have, we're willing to do a grant of just you know, $200 towards marketing or $500 towards marketing. And that that would be a simple application and staff level approval, right, where you would say, every year we're gonna budget X amount and it'll be spent towards marketing and events in downtown. You don't have to answer that now. I'm interested. Especially yeah, if it's worth considering. CRA is uh, contributing to that because you do have expertise on that. I mean, this uh, this group come in with the three hundred dollar budget uh, with twenty five thousand, thirty thousand Latinos and two hundred people show up. Right. They, they, if they promote that, and more will show up, and it will just uh, do well. So right now, just to quickly give you the landscape of events. Um, where can people go to get money for an event, right? This is a question. They either can apply to co-sponsorship from the city, and that's a one time a year process that happens during the budget, and that covers the police, the fire, right, sanitation, those costs that you see there. Um, CRA or city commissioned, um, right, so a special events department, they put on the Sea Blues Festival, right, something like that, or, um, you know, the CRA has an event you all, obviously, Downtown Development Board, um, self-produced, right? The producer pays all the costs. That's rare. Um, <laughs> usually that'll be, you know, there's always some kind of sponsors involved, um, which goes to the next one. You see that a lot with your races, right? Or you think of like the Superboat and um, Frank Chevis, or ticket sales. Um, also, this is very tricky too. Very rare that a special event, at least in our downtown, is going to make money off of ticket sales at this point. Richmond Park is coming. Right. Um, and so when you're doing an event, if it's on private property, no special event permit is needed. Um, an alcohol license may be required. So you eliminate those city special event costs. On public property, it's very hard to predict. We have worked with special events to try to get some ranges of cost, um, but you know, it could be anywhere from 400 to 15,000, um, depending on the scale and, and type of event. Um, the city does have a limitation of only four events per organization per year. I have a question on that. How does the farmer's market work then if they're gonna have, you know, one, one every month or six months, if they're only allowed four? Uh, because they are CRA sponsored, so if it's a city or CRA sponsored, then it can it can be more. So that's the criteria yes. there. Okay, but uh, <laughs> somebody else couldn't do six farmers markets in a year, or like when we had um, I forget her name now. The Natalie. Time. Natalie, yes. Yes, and that's why it ended up going to an RFP process because mm -hmm. she was city sponsored. And then other markets were saying, well, why was she picked and not somebody else? Mm -hmm. um, and so then that... Success was but, the main reason. Yes. But. <laughs> <laughs> I know that is still a sore, sore lingering subject yeah. <laughs> of which we are still trying to build back from. Um, I'm trying to bring it back. She goes, absolutely not. I'm so successful in outlying areas. Uh, not worth my time yeah. to come and battle. That was her last message. Well, and that's why we are sponsoring two different markets, mm -hmm. right, and having the mural and really trying to take advantage of the visibility at that corner and have something going on because we are building that audience for when Coachman Park opens again. Mm -hmm. And we have to start now building that audience and, and raising the awareness and, you know, letting vendors and patrons and everyone know, like, we're welcoming this, markets are happening here, and we're going to have an amazing venue. Um, less than two years. Just as a, an additional bit of historical data, we used to have a, a farmer's market on Cleveland Street for many years. And uh, just as a point of reference, the, the budget, the, the, the amount that DDB would fund them every year was in the range of fifteen to $25,000. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a comparable number of what we did today in approving the Hispanic Outreach Act. Oh, that's good to know. There is a previous history on that, where we did that for many, many years. Okay. So uh, last but not least, um, we wanted to continue to have these conversations and tease out in the next couple of months, really what are your, what are your event funding goals when you look at that? Is it visibility for the DDB? Is it the monthly activity, right? Is it 
as many new organizations as possible. Because um, as we hone in a little more on this, that'll help us know how to attract the right kind of applicants, how to set up the administrative processes where maybe you end up only hearing requests for very large events and we take care of multiple other events administratively for smaller amounts of money, right? However that, that will work. So I, I threw some up here, um, bless you, uh, of event funding goals. And the CRA is going through the same process as well. Something to think about. You want answers on that right now, or do you want us to think about it? If you, if you have immediate reactions, you can share them, but you can also marinate on it. Mm -hmm. Good questions. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the more the merrier, because you technically won't know which one's going to be successful mm -hmm. in this venue. Having the DDB be famous and well known is not my highest priority. No, <laughs> neither. Yeah, I'm just checking. <laughs> yeah. Eagles um, checked at the door. Whatever produces the most action downtown, if it's one big event or ten smaller ones, I just want to see more people downtown. That's just my opinion. I want to beat Dunedin. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm not sure how to make this something you can, something you can hone in on, but it would be good if the funds spent to produce event activity in the downtown could somehow do something to benefit the future viability of downtown. Like if there was some way to, to say this helped downtown, it didn't just bring bodies down for a weekend. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm not sure how to do that, but like we used to bring, you know, many thousands of people for the jazz hall, at, for the Clearwater Jazz Hall, which is a great event. And it's great for Coachman Park, but it did very little actually for downtown, like for businesses downtown or for businesses or for mm -hmm. landowners, property owners. I, I don't see a direct benefit to the people mm -hmm. of, of the, to the DDB of an event like that, even though it's a very worthwhile and important event for Clearwater. So it'd be nice to be able to tie an event. For years we had the Clearwater Just All Day do some component of the the three days that they were going to do it, add an extra day and do it downtown, so that it had some downtown component. So any way that we can do something that influences the impact on the benefits downtown, obviously is key in seeing that the funds are well spent and don't just put on a good event for the benefit of the public that's attending it. It's not intended to benefit the public, it's intended to benefit the Clearwater downtown. Well, really, I mean both. Obviously, to induce the public to come, it's got to be something worthwhile that benefits them. But the, the spending of the funds is to produce an effect on our downtown, in, in my view. Thank you. Um, most of the people I talk to have a hard time spelling DDB, <laughs> truthfully, yeah. right? Um, I steer people to Howard on a regular basis, but I think it's just lack of people knowing they can get funding for events. I mean, I'm hearing what we're talking about, but maybe as it's, if we can collaborate more, which we'll be talking about soon, with Amplify, with what the city's sending out, so that it gets more and more known to, for more requests, then this tends to dis dissipate. Justice? Okay. All right. Did you I think we're good. That is very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Okay. Okay, old business. 5.1, Downtown Coordination Committee update. Keenan and Eric Santiago. Eric Santiago, uh, Public Relations um, and Program Manager, just going to provide an update on the Coordination Committee. Uh, I'm actually going to start with a summary of the Coordination Committee, uh, which originally brought together four uh, separate groups together, Amplify Clearwater, Clearwater Downtown Partnership, Downtown Clearwater Merch Association, and the DDB. Uh, this group met a total of three times. First one was on June 30th, second meeting was on August 17th, and the last meeting was held on October 7th. Um, the first meeting was held in the library. Uh, all the groups came together uh, for the first time for brainstorming, and the uh, recommendation was made to bring a facilitator. Um, 
a facilitator was found, uh, which was brought in for the second meeting, which was also held in the library. Uh, the facilitator was Collaborative Labs. Um, the second meeting was meant to have the group come together um, and really provide guidance to the facilitator on what would be the third meeting, which was the workshop. Uh, the workshop was the last meeting held, um, which was held at Collaborative Labs at St. Petersburg College. Uh, this was a, again, half-day workshop that was led by the facilitator. All four groups were there, um, and I wanted to have Keenan provide um, his experience at that uh, half-day workshop. It was great, uh, as the mayor pointed out. It was very collaborative, <laughs> appropriately named organization. Um, extremely professional, well-run, good food. I highly recommend anyone, anyone else that would like to go. Um, I couple notes. Um, I thought the rapport building exercises were great for us to get to know each other. Um, and in particular, I would say it pointed out areas where we could um, maybe support each other and then not cross over our energy, you know, into where we're stepping on each other's toes. Um, and I do think, just in summary from my point of view, meeting quarterly on a regular basis, um, so the agenda is kind of focused towards some imagined Clearwater type vibe is going to be very helpful and beneficial. So that, it was very positive for my opinion. I'm saying all four groups again did. Um, oh, was there a question? Uh, all four groups again did um, share the interest of continuing uh, this discussion in the future. Um, there was. Um, Sorry, I forgot one thing. Yes. Um, I didn't point it out at the meeting, but uh, and our attorney uh, reminded me. Uh, maybe she could expound on this a bit. Um, my presence there by being designated by the board makes it a DDB meeting. I thought because Caitlin didn't come, it was no longer that. No, no, and it was so. advertised and all those things. It, 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 yes. They treated it like a DDB yeah. meeting. Okay, yeah. No, my, my issue was you all, you went to a meeting as one of four groups and one of the two topics was how to learn to be a better not-for-profit entity. This is not a not-for-profit entity. The other three are. You are a government entity, all right? You can't, you can help coordinate this group. You are not, there are all sorts of conflicts with you actually being part of this group um, and since it, it because you are not one of them they are totally different entities than you are the CRA is a government entity they are not a not-for-profit the city is a government entity it's not a not a not-for-profit you are not a not-for-profit you're a government taxing district if any of you as individual DDB members attends a meeting, and they did, they did it right, they, they, they treated it, but I want you all to understand it. If any of you say, I think that the downtown um, merchants organization, I didn't say it right, um, is having a topic that I think is going to be of interest and helpful to me as a DDB member, and I'm going to go and participate and find out. That's not a meeting that we have to advertise. That's not a meeting. Uh, the, the commissioners go to meetings like that all the time to find out what the citizens want. That's part of your job you should be doing that, okay? You should be finding out what your constituents want. And we don't have to advertise every meeting you guys go to as individual DDB members. We don't have to treat those as meetings. Now, if two of you go and start discussing with each other, then we need to talk. Okay, but if one of them, and we'll get to the nitty gritty if that comes up, but I don't think we need to get into all of that tonight. I just want you to be aware of the difference. On this one, Keenan did not go as an individual member of the DDB who wanted to find out more. He went as an appointed by the DDB representative to this group on behalf of the DDB to help coordinate these organizations. That turns it into a DDB committee, a DDB meeting, whether we have one of you or all of y'all. 
That turns it into a meeting that needs to be advertised, that needs to be publicly accessible, and that needs to have minutes. Staff understands that, and, and I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is seeing notes coming out of a meeting where there's no mention of the fact that you are a governmental entity and that, that um, it looks like you are one of four not-for-profits learning how to be a good not-for-profit. Because you can't do that. You aren't one. So, uh, unless it's just a matter of personal interest. So that's what I had an issue with. And every time I hear you guys saying, but if there's only one of us there, I'm like, no. If you're appointed as a representative, and, and like I said, I know it's being done right because staff understands this, but you all need to understand it that you are there as a public officer, not a private citizen. Okay. Okay. Uh, Amanda, what were you Well, I, I do just want to say that there is a, a table in the back that makes it very clear what the DDB is as an organization. So, and, and the reason that that topic was on there is because the DDB does sit as a funder. So it wasn't, there are some, um, you want them, you want the organizations to be our funding to know how to do this. Uh, to better understand what those groups need when they come and ask, because part of the DC May's ask has been for staff, right? So part of how to be a successful nonprofit and having special events that generate revenue, right? Like we were just talking about, what does it mean? You know, how, how do they build sustainable sources of funding so the DDB is not always writing, you know, 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the check? So that's why that was a topic and why the, it wasn't so the DDB could be a nonprofit. It was for in your role as a funder to get a better understanding of where the organizations in this community are at and what kind of needs they have and what success would look like. Where Eric, I mean, it's a very brief summary, but Eric has vast experience um, in these business improvement districts, the DCMA type organizations from his time in Chicago, and they make money. Um, so <laughs> Eric was also sharing that, um, which I, you know, I believe was helpful to hear and bring back of what does it look like in functioning in other functioning smaller and larger contexts. So, um, so just so just so you know, we were not trying to turn them into a, a not a five hundred one. The um, the other part of that is when you're talking about quarterly meetings. They can meet without you, but if you think that you have a role to play, recognize that if you're attending quarterly meetings, you have expenses. You have, you have the advertising expenses, you have staff time, mm -hmm. and you have, you have somebody taking minutes for you. So do recognize when you're talking about whether you're going to be part of quarterly meetings with this group, you're talking about expenses that would not exist without you. Okay, so you have to have a clear idea of what your role is to play. Okay. Thank you. Um, Eric, did you have more? Um, I mean, we will, um, next steps, we'll get back to the three other organizations um, on how they can move forward. Okay, very good. So the... Uh, the time is hurtling forward, so we're trying to keep things as brief as possible. But you have an update for us on the next agenda item, CRA update? Um, I have one thing, and then I'll turn that over to Howard. Um, the Clyde Butcher Everglades exhibit is up. We have a press event tomorrow. Um, it'll officially open this Saturday. There will be a book signing with the artist Clyde Butcher from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So I encourage you all to attend right here in the main library right outside these doors. So you walk out and make a right, and it's um, all throughout the atrium and down um, the other hall. It's, it's stunning work, uh, beautiful. It will be here through May 31st. Um, and we are, are, first we just needed to get it up, and then we will have a very robust slate of programming um, from January through May of next year. We'll start reaching out to partners and, and developing that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Helen. Board, I just want to bring a couple updates for a different, uh, for a couple of events um, that are happening in um, downtown for the month of November, um, and also a new business that has opened. Last month, we reported on several businesses that will be coming to 
the downtown Clearwater area. And with that, Jamaica Vibes Grill is an authentic Caribbean food. They are now open. They're located at 623 Cleveland Street. Um, a couple of their best dishes that are on the menu is oxtail and jerk, tick, jerk chicken. They're open uh, Thursday through Sunday from 11 to 8 p.m. and then Sunday from 11 to 5. Also for the month, um, we're having the Clearwater Sangria Festival that's presented by Aspiration Winery. That will take place on November 13th from um, 1230 to 11 p.m. and it's free admission to attend that event. Um, we also have the Market Marie daytime market that will also happen on November 13th and that will be from 9 a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. And we also have the Art and Art in the Evening, which is an art, fashion, poetry, and live music event that's taking place at DeLuca Restaurant. Uh, and that will be on November 14th from 7 o'clock p.m. to 10 o'clock p.m. And that's also free. Um, the CRA, we're in the process of doing our holiday extravaganza, so we will bring you, be bringing you more updates next month for what we'll be doing in downtown for holiday events. But a couple of things that's underway right now, we have our holiday window decorations. The CRA has partnered with 49 local businesses in the downtown area to um, decorate two storefront windows. Um, with this, it'll be one of three things, which will be holiday, winter and snow, or New Year's. Um, and again, that's the staff throughout this area district, as well as we're doing our holiday marketing program. Right now, I'm working with uh, working and soliciting local businesses to participate in this program. And what the program is actually is a $10 credit towards a minimum bill purchase of $15 or more that's approved at local retail businesses, restaurants, and cafes. So it's kind of like an updated version of our uh, mail voucher program, but we're expanding it to the entire city for all businesses that want to participate. And for that, residents, visitors, and guests will receive the $10 voucher once they go to a designated website. And actually, I'm registered to be able to get the voucher, and it will have a unique code that will be provided to them. And then starting December 1st through the 31st, they can redeem uh, that voucher at the local businesses that will be participating. So all this information is listed at the um, Surrey website, at, which is www.downtownclearwater.com. And should anybody have any questions, want to find out more information, they can go to that website or contact me directly at howard.smith at myclearwater.com. Fantastic. All right, thank you. Very good. Okay. The uh, chairman's report listed a number of um, events that are coming up that Howard. Oh. Just uh, went over, so I won't. I won't repeat them. Uh, if anybody's interested, it's uh, they're listed on the. Uh, I think on the agenda for today. Now, uh, I was going to make a presentation as part of my chairman's report about a topic I think we should discuss. I won't do it today because of the the time that we've gotten, you know, that it's gotten to. But I just wanted to tell you what it is, and I think that we have. Uh, been relying the last year or two on having people come to us with requests for ideas for what to do with the DDB's budget and how to spend it and and what the ideas were. They're coming from outside us and we are reacting to them. And I was thinking we should take also a more proactive approach at uh, ourselves identifying what needs to happen downtown, what could improve the situation downtown, and come up with some plans that could complement, you know, the people that come to ask for, to us for funds, maybe we can have some programs that we've originated ourselves that we can identify mm -hmm. as being needed and wanted in our downtown. And I'm going to ask for a, some time on the agenda at a future meeting mm -hmm. where we can discuss this and uh, maybe come up with some bright ideas on where we want the DDB to go. Okay, so right. that's all I'll say about it at this point. Uh, so now we'll move on to item seven, board members to be heard, beginning on my left. Um, I'm real excited about watching all the construction that starts at the coachman and goes all the way to the shell station, I think. It's just nice seeing the, it occur. Um, and because of that, I uh, just recently had a lease signed, 4,000 square feet for a new business downtown. So I think that construction aided that person coming downtown right. so it's going to get more fun plus i had my windows painted by you guys <laughs> and it gives me the christmas spirit very good i'm one of the 49 you know okay, i'm excited for the holidays and um 
I've never been excited about dust coming to my uh, apartment, but uh, all the construction happening and all the dust is actually very welcoming. <laughs> so <laughs> it's great. And by the way, just a reminder, go Bucks. Um, <laughs> that's Buccaneers. Um, right. um, our friends at the Vapor Shop, the Vapor, the Vape Shop, on Drew Street, Drew, mm -hmm. or on, uh, right next down, to, uh, next door to us, Drew from the Vape Shop on Cleveland, is opening a. It's not really downtown, but um, very close. The old pawn shop on Myrtle, right? Or, um, they have a very successful axe throwing bar down in St. Pete, believe it or not. Very successful, where they have lanes, like bowling or darts, and they're opening this soon, I believe. Oh, yeah, that's right. So anyone who's wanting to take out any holiday aggression will have an axe bar <laughs> walking distance. So it's no dwarf tossing. No, not that I know of. Okay. Sure. It's good to see all the activity that is beginning to happen in the area. I had someone mention to me that there's nothing for children to do. That's why families don't come down. So I'm excited to see more stores mm -hmm. opening up and getting more family activities in the area because we'll get more uh, people coming down when we have that. So our future plans with the Magic Clearwater and all that is definitely going to help. And it's great to see more activities happening with the farmers markets and all that. I think it's uh, it's very promising. Very good. Yes, I like to really look forward to the chairman's uh, presentation, and also I'd like to congratulate the DCMA for winning the Business Award. I think that's Ooh. something we should recognize for their hard work. Thank you. Very good. I just wanted to make a comment, uh, Chairman, on one of the things you said about Jazz Holiday, mm -hmm. um, and I want people to understand how Imagine Clearwater is going to be different. You know, imagine, I mean, Jazz Holiday is a festival, so it goes from early in the afternoon throughout the night. I think the majority of events that we're going to have down at the amphitheater and the new Imagine Coachman Park are going to be shorter. So you are going to see a lot more impact because people will either go somewhere before or after mm -hmm. the show, mm -hmm. very much like the Capitol Theater. If mm -hmm. you talk to the restaurants on the weekends or the nights that the Capitol Theater is programmed, they're slammed. Mm -hmm. yes. A couple weekends ago, we had three sold out shows in a row. They didn't know what to do with themselves. They had so much business. So I just want to point that out to people that a lot of the entertainment that is going to occur in the future is going to be two to three hours rather than 10. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think people are gonna move out. And the dust is gonna to continue to fly. It's the price of progress. Cool. I've apologized to many people at Water's Edge, but we're gonna have 4,000 dump trucks of fill coming in. <laughs> when you see them on Golf to Bay, they're either coming or going. I welcome it. So. Okay. Very good, progress. <laughs> I'm excited to sit down with Amanda next week to talk about the possibility of bringing some live theater downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps starting with some simple stage readings, so even some children's theater. Oh. Yeah. We've got a very talented woman from Manhattan who's moved down here and wants to uh, bring her troop with her. Um, also, uh, on a personal note, I, I, I'd like to see us move the question from how could we get the homeless out of our site to how could we get them into a home? And mm -hmm. I, I need to be concentrating on that much more in the next couple of years at least while I'm still around. Uh, I think that's important. Okay. And um, I just wanted, in case my comments were not quite clear, I don't have anything against, I'm a big supporter of Clearwater Jazz Holiday and, and a big supporter as the DDB is of the Wanderlust series that's starting up again shortly. Um, that was simply an example of events that are, that are ticketed, that you, get a vet, that you get a band and you come in and you can't leave and you're there basically at 
down in the park for 10 hours, that doesn't really do anything for downtown. And it, other than create parking issues and people that want to go to the bathroom on their way home. Because I've, I've you know, been in business for 30 some events like this and uh, we didn't benefit financially from it. If anybody should have, it should have been the businesses that were open and there as lots of people came by. So I think I can speak with some authority that that type of event. Now we're hoping that Imagine Clearwater will result in programmed events with a tie-in to downtown that will actually do something for the downtown. So just to be clear on that, I wasn't trying to... Uh, I did not construe it that way. Okay, I just good. want to just make it for the public to understand yeah. some of that. Okay. Very good. And with that, it is now 7.19, 7.20 in the evening, and this meeting is adjourned.